Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Right, so Project.NET Gadgeteer is a project of our Sensors and Devices group and I got engaged about a year ago because I'm of course in uh, Microsoft Research Connections. We do outreach and now uh, in the last year we've done outreach around the .NET Gadgeteer project. So last, uh, yesterday you'll remember Ken Woodbury giving the lab introduction and he talked about a project called SenseCam. Um, this, this device is camera that you wear and it takes pictures every time you move and it's actually quite a powerful device for people with memory loss um, and interesting medical, um, medical applications have developed with the SenseCam. So the SenseCam is also a project of the Sense and Devices group that was started probably close to 10 years ago. Um, when SenseCam was started, the prototyping of the first SenseCam took overall almost two man years to get the first, to get the, the device done. So that's a lot of time and of course it costs a lot of money um, to create such device. And this was actually the motivation, this and such similar projects, for our sensors and devices uh, team because they found nothing out there that helped them to prototype devices quickly. So that's how they started with this project, how it came about. It was really meant to be a kind of rapid prototyping tool for small electronic devices and, and gadgets, um, primarily in the kind of pervasive and Ubicom research arena. So, a rapid prototyping platform for small electronic devices. But there are two important characteristics that this uh, tool has um, that really make it quite suitable for outreach. One is it has a low threshold and the other one is it has a high ceiling. So what does that mean? Low threshold means you can do um, kind of quite sophisticated projects quite easily. So for example, a digital camera with, with SD card storage takes about less than half an hour to build for even a beginner, so you really need no background at all, so low threshold, really easy to get started with. But at, at the same time, high ceiling means that you can really build very sophisticated devices too with, with this technology. And in the last year, we then saw a lot of excitement in different communities. So we've even worked with schools, so you see some outcome of, the, of school projects we did, of school pilot projects in the UK and the US. Wonderful things kids have done just after uh, 10 hours uh, uh, work with, with the technology. Then, of course, the make and hobbyist community is also very interested, and we've been to exciting events like Make a Fair New York and Make a Fair Bay Area in the course of the last year. And then, of course, the research community and Pervasive and Ubicom are working with it quite extensively. And you'll also see a couple of research projects displayed here, an intelligent shopping cart handle that tells you whether devices, uh, whether food is environmentally friendly and then as what we call a preheat pre home heating system for monitoring um, energy consumption in the home and, and adapting it. So really quite broad, broad uh, applicability. Right, these show some, um, some examples, some other kind of uh, projects out of the pervasive Ubicom research uh, arena um, that are just related, related project, uh, projects. Uh, one is media cup that kind of gives you some, some feedback on whether the cup is full or not. Then you recognize the sense cam from yesterday. That is, of course, our, our own project. Then this is something called a prayer companion. It's actually used in a monastery, uh, I believe in the UK somewhere, and it tells nuns when something of interest has happened because they are living in a very closed world, so they, they can adapt their prayers accordingly. And then uh, an ambient wood device, which is basically a tool for children to explore their physical environment. So these are all research projects in the pervasive community that are presented at, at related conferences. So when, uh, when the sensors and devices group started to look at that technology that is required, they of course looked out there and saw what technology is currently available. And there is related technology available that you can buy off the shelf, and this just um, shows some examples. But it's nothing quite that kind of met, met the bar for what they wanted to achieve with the Gadgeteer project. So you may have heard of Arduino, for example. There's also Lego Mindstorm and just another, uh, a number of kind of related technologies, some Arduino-based, 
uh, down here is a technology called Fidgets. But as I said, nothing that kind of really did what they wanted to achieve, this tool for rapid prototyping um, of small electronic devices. So just an example to kind of get you going and show you what, what the technology is about. I'll show you an example. They wanted to build a, a, a kind of a gadget, a workable gadget with an encasing. So not just the, the hardware and the software, but also kind of put it in a nice kind of form. Um, and they, they did this device, uh, a computer game, a Tetris game. Um, in an encasing in about 24 hours. And the, the next slides just uh, summarize how this process went. So it took about five minutes to connect the hardware. And this is the old prototype hardware that Gadgeteer used before last year, because last year now, this, uh, since last year, this, uh, this technology is commercially available. So similar to SenseCam, we now have external hardware manufacturers who sell Gadgeteer hardware, and you can actually buy it on Amazon uh, today. But this is a prototype hardware, and this shows, shows uh, the different modules that are required for the device. And then in the next step, so you plug them together, and the next step they need to be programmed. So in this case, it took about five hours to write the computer game in C Sharp. And then in the next uh, step, you design the encasing. So that's actually quite, um, quite a lot of overhead required there with some 3D CAT model, design the encasing. 3D print the encasing. You will have heard of 3D printers, and they can really do amazing, thing, amazing things nowadays. That takes quite a while to print it. We have such printer here, for example, in the lab. So six hours for printing the encasing, and then assembling the device and just get going with your Tetris game. So really, uh, a computer game, a workable computer game from scratch in 24 hours. So that's a, that's a great achievement. And if this technology would have been available for the SenseCam, the work could have, done, could have been done in a matter of hours. So that's how the project uh, uh, came about. This, this was the motivation, um, and it is used accordingly. And I would like to now go through the different steps. On the one hand, you have the hardware, so I'll t tell you a little bit more about this then the software tools that are needed to program your hardware, and then also what we call the physical form factor. And that's actually quite interesting because that opens this whole research project up for, for this kind of design area for people who design new types of devices. <coughs> so we have a few research collaborations with uh, design schools, for example. And it's quite amazing because they look at the design first and then use the hardware and the software to kind of enable uh, the creation of their tool, whereas we, of course, as computer scientists, we look at, at the hardware first and program it, and then kind of think about the physical presentation later. But this is kind of makes it quite interesting and quite broadly applicable, because now we are working with designers as well as with hardware people. Right, so the hardware. So um, last year when uh, we, we launched, we, call, we launched Gadgeteer as a commercial um, product that was in August, we had one main board and about 10 modules available from a hardware manufacturer in the US. In the meanwhile now we have uh, seven main boards and about 80 modules available from six hardware manufacturers around the world. So quite a broad hardware spectrum. We have the main boards with different characteristics, different processes and different speeds, um, et cetera. By now a whole lot of, of sensors are available and this, these slides just give you a brief overview of what you what types of sensors are, um, modules are available. These are, for example, sensors. There is uh, something to me measure moisture, temperature, humidity, kind of quite obvious things also here. Pulse oximeter, so kind of some more unusual things. There's a GPS up there. So sensors, then modules for communication, wired communication, ethernet, and then wireless communication, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and then also, um, cellular radio, and then of course you have d displays. Um, they're actually used with mo most gadgeteer kits, various uh, forms of displays, and then also user input modules, like you have simple buttons or joysticks, potentiometer, etc. Then the, the camera, of course, that, we, that you will see later on for the camera project. 
Then we have the red modules. Those are the modules that provide power to the main board. So each of your gadget need, need, what needs one and exactly one red module. And then storage and, and audio modules, so storage, SD card, micro SD card, etc. And this is an interesting slide because this is um, so-called extender modules because the platform is open source, so it's all actually extensible. Um, the software can be downloaded and people can actually build their own modules with these extensor modules. All the kind of information you need to do this is, is uh, openly accessible. So we have actually, there are a number of modules that are kind of maker created that are being sold even out there in the community. Right, so, and this is, this is how a, a, a main board, what a main board looks like. And it, it kind of, I want to explain why it's so easy to use it. I mean, um, so you have the, um, do you have different, you have sockets here. So all the, yeah, 14 different sockets and they are all the same basically, but they have different types. And the types are indicated by the letters there. So it's actually quite easy to work with it because you have one type, one, one kind of uh, socket, one type, one kind of cable that you use to to connect your um, your modules up, and then you have a specification of what these different socket types do. So, for example, pins one, two, and ten they uh, they connect to 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and ground, and all the other pins are depending on the socket type you have. And this is a table that we've published, so people who <coughs> know about hardware, and even people don't know so much about hardware, but it's kind of quite easy for them to kind of find out what the different socket, socket types do and how you can use them and how you can actually also plug in the module that you would use with Gadgeteer that is perhaps not readily available in the market yet. Right, so what you end up uh, with is you have these modules and you see they have, some, uh, they have their letters there and they just have to be plugged in um, into the socket with a compatible with the same letter and that's basically the same socket type and you know that, that they kind of work together. And if it's plugged into a different one, uh, the module won't break, it just won't work. So it's really very, very foolproof um, to use and to plug the, the hardware together. But uh, what makes it even easier is the software tools that we provide to plug the hardware together. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about this. But first of all, just a little, little background. So Gadgeteer, the Gadgeteer SDK works on what's called the .NET Micro Framework. So that's basically .NET for very constrained small devices. And what it does is basically, um, you, can, you can now use with this, uh, uh, with this framework, you can use the same tools that developers use for uh, .NET programming on desktop, you can now use on these very constrained devices. So it provides things like interactive debugging, auto-completion of commands, etc. It's really very, very intuitive um, to use this. And then on top of the .NET micro framework, you'll have your Gadgeteer um, SDK with all the libraries, and this is basically what abstracts all the low-level hardware features away from the end user. So you, don't, you didn't see any of the complexity that the hardware provides, but you just see kind of very modular object-oriented uh, programming environment. So just a, a module is just called a button, for example, and no hardware details are, in, are included. So when you start, once you um, when you start a Gadgeteer project, this is a Visual Studio view. You start a Visual Studio Gadgeteer project. It also runs on the Express Edition, so there are free uh, programming environments um, available for for uh, programming Gadgeteer. And what you start to see is this: what we call the designer view. So so this is the first thing you, you see, and it basically you start with the main board. So it's a visual presentation of your hardware. So you start with the main board and then you can just drag and drop those modules in that you would like to use for your project. And you can then have them kind of get suggestions about how you connect them to your main board. So it just more or less does it automatically and it tells you which of the sockets are, uh, are compatible. I mean, it's quite easy to do that from when you see the hardware because it's all labeled, but this of course makes it even easier. 
And this is basically what a program looks like in C-sharp for the digital camera. So those of you who will do the workshop later on will program this. And we've done it quite, uh, quite a number of times during the last year. We've done it with schools. We've done it with uh, teachers. We've done it with uh, developers and hobbyists and um, university researchers, etc. Surprisingly, of course, the kids find it easiest. So they really, in no time at all, they kind of get all the hardware together, where, where some are, sometimes the adults really <laughs> take a long time to get the cables in. But it is very intuitive, and as you see, it's only about 10, uh, 10 lines of code, and a lot of this is also auto-completed, so you just have to start uh, writing your line of code, and then it's all the kind of event handler code, for example, is just automatically um, included in your program. So really dead easy to get the digital camera working. And we've done, for example, this workshop that you're going to do. We have done it um, for within Microsoft and externally um, quite a number of times. Right, so much about the software. And that was, of course, a very simple pro uh, project and program. Of course, it can get very complex depending on what you want your device to do. So we have, we'll show you different examples of what you do, but of course, you know, computer games and, and also, uh, different types of applications, and it can get arbitrarily complex to, to write the code, and also in terms of the modules that you use for your project. But it, um, let me also talk about the, the physical design, the, the enclosure um, of your de uh, device, because that's very interesting, and it kind of makes that project interesting because it's not just computer science, but it's also de the design side. So what you end up when you've done the project that I just explained is basically something like this. So you just have all your modules connected to the main board and hopefully the camera will run and you can take some pictures, but that's not a device, of course. So if you want to get, uh, get it done properly, so this is you know, just a bit of hardware fiddled together. It's not very nice and certainly not easy to take pictures with something like that. So this is just a first step in the right direction. This is something we produce. It's just cardboard that is laser cut, and you, we sometimes take that along to, along to workshops because you can have, have students and, and researchers just ask them to kind of fold their own cardboard and casing up and, uh, for their digital camera. But you can do much more sophisticated things as well. And because we've standardized everything for gadgeteers, so the pinhole size, for example, is standardized, and the grid, the, the, the breadth of the grid is all uh, 15 millimeters, I think. There, it's all standardized, and that means you can also use kind of off-the-shelf mounting platforms. These are available from kind of in the maker community, and they can just be used seamlessly with Gadgeteer to assemble, for example, for a robot like this, assemble your hardware together. But what we've also done, we've created 3D mod uh, models for, the mod for a lot of the modules and main boards that we have. 3D models that can be used with 3D CAD tools like SolidWorks, for example, so that you can produce your own encasing with, uh, for this technology. It makes it really quite easy. And this is something for, for the prototype hardware we had, so that was before the commercial hardware. We had a plug-in for SolidWorks. And you, you see on the right hand there is the, the, the plugin for .NET Gadgeteer. And it enabled you to just drag in the modules that you have, uh, position them, and then uh, the mounting features, um, these little, these hooks, for example, they would be created automatically. And also the cutout, for example, here for your um, Ethernet connection. So all done automatically, and then depending on what, what kind of tool you have, either a laser cutter or a 3D printer, you could either laser cut it quite, quite easily or get it uh, 3D printed. And it's actually quite, has, has anyone seen um, 3D printers before? Who has? Yeah, you've got them in your departments? Yeah. So it's really very easy to use. So just to finish off, I would like to show you some examples um, that, that we have done. This is, for example, a moisture sensor. This is a device that kind of monitors the moistures of your plants at home. And uh, on the display, it kind of shows how humid it is, either very dry or very <coughs> humid. And what it also does is when the plant is too wet, for example, it sends an SMS 
um, to, to some mobile phone to indicate that, that the, the plant is in trouble. So that's kind of one device that we um, that were created. And do keep in mind this, I mean, some of these devices sound like kind of fun and perhaps not serious uh, use, but do keep in mind that in the pervasive Ubicom community, you kind of research a lot around new types of devices and new types of applications, and the SenseCam is just one very good example there. So this is the, the finished, co completed device, and you have the little hook for your moisture sensor there as well, so that is quite neat. Um, and this is a research that uh, the sensors and devices team have, have done around a home heating system. So that's actually employed in the homes of the team. Um, so you have in, in every room, you have like monitoring stations to see what the current temperature, et cetera, is like, but also uh, when the room is, is inhabited and kind of the, the system communicates within the home and tries to kind of learn um, when a room is being used and adapt the heating accordingly. So this resulted in a, in a paper at Ubicom um, last year. And here you also see the different um, the iteration of the, of the design of the physical encasing because they started with something like simple cardboard like this. And then, for example, found out that the temperature sensor, if it's too close to the processor, it just gets too warm and it doesn't work properly. So that was then attached outside. And it was just iterated to perfectionize the, um, the design of the encasing. Right, another quite uh, sweet example. I think this was another 24-hour project. And you see here, I mean, I think it's more kind of the design side of the, of the device because there was some initial kind of design on paper, then cardboard prototyping of, the, of this device, and then finally the 3D printing. And this is a little toy bear. So when you get, it's got the, an ultrasound uh, a sensor, and when you get too close to the bear, it kind of makes a grim face, and it also moves its, its eyebrows down. So I don't possibly will be able to show this, uh, this device tomorrow as well. And this is just a whole, uh, a, a number of projects that uh, were presented in recent papers. So, so for example, just a couple of weeks ago, when the, this main the Gadgeteer research paper was presented, there were already, already a number of papers based on Gadgeteer, um, but also some, the, the home heating system that was presented in the past, for example, and some kind of, quite fun thing. So you see the shopping cart handle as well uh, up there. And this, I think, is, is a device that you can use in two remote places. And it makes this, um, this sushi plate turn in the same direction, depending on, um, so that people who sit on the other side of, um, uh, will basically get the same, uh, presented the, the same food. So quite, quite some fun things. And our computer mediated living room do some really interesting projects in that space. Right, so as I said, what, what do I do with this project? I mean, I've, I got involved about a year ago because our group, um, Microsoft Research Connection, said there is really good outreach potential. People are really interested to use it. So I've spent the last year to work working with the group on outreach in school. So we have had extensive school pilots in the UK and in the US. Uh, we're starting to work. Um, there's already close collaboration with some universities. We're starting to extend this also. And then, of course, the maker community. So it's been really good fun. And you, know, a lot, you see a lot of uh, hardware enthusiasts who really get very excited to work with this. So what we've um, done, for example, we've created a nice web page that kind of gets you, gives you a good summary of information. This is um, actually where you, the, the CodeFlex uh, um, website um, that enables you to kind of download all the SDKs and um, also these module builders guides, etc. if you want to kind of get going y yourself. Um, then our website, which has a lot of example projects as well, um, and some background information on the project, also some kind of educational materials on there. Um, and then finally, you know, after yeah, just more than half a year, you can now use uh, buy the hardware even from Amazon and Mauser and big, kind of big uh, electronics distributors. So it's really quite exciting to be involved in a project and see it launch and kind of see it. Uh, then ending up on Amazon. So it's, uh, it's really good fun. And the ones, um, you'll have the chance to kind of get your hands on it and just have a look at what, what hardware, what projects we have done in the lab and some external ones as well later today and then also tomorrow. Okay, thank you. That's
or from my side. Okay, thanks, Scarlett. So, uh, any questions? Got a couple of minutes. Yep. Um, I like to know what kind of uh, um, target market do you address. So, there is always a trade-off, probably between the price and, and availability, and, and you know, potentially in, uh, selling these things. Yeah, so just to of course. It's, I mean, we don't. It's, it's open source from Microsoft. So, the people who make the money are the hardware manufacturers. And these are people we have just, we provide the open, the, the platform to them open source. So it's them who, who produce and sell the hardware. So we don't make any money from this um, at all. We're just interested in the, so similar to actually the other project that are not hardware, we're just interested in the technology. We've produced it and we want it to be used because we saw the interest in the community. Um, so that's our yeah, sure. Uh, I just meant which community is that actually? It's, uh, is it hobbies? Or is it you know education, businesses, or small businesses, startups, or all of Yeah, this? we don't constrain it uh, too much to, to one community. I mean, on, uh, in, in my work, I am interested mainly in the university community, but for example, the, the manufacturers, and they are, of course, you know, they, are, they create their own community, and they are mainly interested in the kind of maker community. Um, but we also see... Um, uh, professionals who need to do tasks like the sensors and devices group, the rapid prototyping, who like to use this uh, for their own prototyping tasks. So the community is quite wide and broad, and we would like to keep it that way. So from our side, certainly, we don't want to do anything that constrains that. Uh, if I may ask a second question. Go ahead. Carry on. Okay. Um, you showed this uh, visual designer in Visual Studio. So is there also a, an emulation of that? Like... This. No, we don't have emulation for the different hardware modules and mainboards, etc., because it would really get very, very complicated. Because we now have uh, have um, six uh, mainboards, seven mainboards, and about 80 modules. Um, so this is a task that we ourselves could not handle. We've certainly, I mean, it's certainly a desirable thing to do, but it would be very complex to realize. Thank you. Yeah, what would you say are the main differences to Arduino? It's much more high level uh, than Arduino. So Arduino, you would really work with the low level hardware, whereas here you have seen in these typical like 24 hour projects, the time it takes to assemble the hardware is really just uh, five to 10 minutes. So it's, it's, it's much uh, higher level. And I've heard, I mean, I haven't worked with my Arduino myself, but I've heard people, who, for example, said a digital camera with Arduino would be certainly at, at least a week, uh, whereas we can do it. And um, I think our team can do it in three minutes, but... Uh, but you can do the I more complicated things minutes. as well, right? Sorry? There's nothing stopping you from doing the more complicated things as well. Um, with, with this, yeah? With this, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can. And, and tomorrow, actually, you will see some of the, of the, very, of, of the more complex um, projects that we have. I think we need to move on. Maybe one more question, and then we'll uh, move on. Because there's the workshop as well. So. So is, there an, uh, is there any limit on the number of modules you can use? Sorry? Is there any limit on number of modules? I think that depends on the community, what they come up with. Uh, and I mean, the number of modules you can use at once in one device. All oh, right, yes, with, with one main board, there is. I mean, some of the modules are what's called daisy chainable, so you can, like LEDs, you can connect one after the other, but a main board only has so many sockets, so that, that uh, limits the number of, of hardware modules. There is one type of main board. No, there are, there are seven different main boards now with different soccer types. Um, I don't know, perhaps Steve, who uh, heads the Sense and Devices group, is sitting behind you. Perhaps, Steve, you have a comment there? Yeah, or? one of the main boards. I think the, the main... I, I think the, the main board with the most number of sockets has got 14. There might have been a picture of it. It's called Hydra. Um, so you can plug up to 14 uh, modules directly into that. But as Scarlett says, uh, some of the modules are daisy chainable. So came up with this notion that in the case of LEDs where you might want an arbitrary number, um, you, you can kind of, e e each module has a socket that you use to connect to the main board. But it has a downstream socket too, so you can add more. But uh, the other thing just to kind of to make clear is of those 14 sockets on a Hydra on that particular type of main board. So the sockets, as Scarlett says, that the physically the, the connectors are all identical. So you use the same cables. And, but but they, because they have these different socket types, so if you, there are, for example, there's, um, if you want to plug a display in, a color display, we, we support that. Um, but uh, that display actually needs three sockets. It needs an R, a G, and a B for red, green, and blue. And there's only one of each of those. You can only plug one display in, and that display actually, in that case, takes up three sockets. Or if you, if you pick something like an Ethernet you know, module, you might only be able to plug one of those into a given mainboard. But what we've tried to do in the design is, is obviously 
uh, and work with the manufacturers so that it's, it's not the case that um, a socket, a physical socket, only supports one type. Most of those sockets support multiple types, just not all of them. So if you've got a particular module, you might find, you know, there's half a dozen sockets it plugs into. Another module might only plug into one type. What we've tried to do into one socket, what we've tried to do is make it so that for most of the kind of designs you want to do, you don't run out of sockets too quickly. But, uh, you know, nothing's perfect, so you, you'll always find a case where you can't quite do what you want. All right, I think we better wrap it up there. So.